So PCA, yeah, as I was saying, it's it's an ordination technique. It's a way that very common way now, uh, certainly in my research area and, and a bunch of them, um, those of you who work on like blood spatter, for example, or or molecular stuff, genomic stuff, PCA, it's often kind of hidden under the hood of analyses. And that's kind of dangerous actually, because um, there's lots of discipline dedicated software, you know, the kind of software where you put in, I don't know, the results of water, water uh, chemistry analysis or forensic analysis or genomic analysis. And it kind of does various analyses under the hood and then spits out some result. I was, I was just working with my daughter. I've never, there's probably a few of you who have worked with like biobanks. She's working with the UK biobank where there's basically the genomes of half a million people are stored in them. So there's lots of analyses and that volume of data, lots of analyses that kind of happen kind of out of almost out of the view of the researcher. The dangerous thing about that um, is, it, in my experience anyway, the further you get away from the data, sometimes the less you understand what's going on. So, um, so I'll walk you into PCA and uh, this introduces, I have this weird um, physical thing that I do when I'm, when I'm talking about multivariate analysis, now that we're getting into things like PCA and, and multivariate analysis of variance and discriminant analysis, as it's called. And it's looking for an axis. I mean, we know that, you know, you plotted like in lab one, uh, scatter plots, remember, of two of your quantitative variables, and I'm already doing it. So I have this thing where I have the X and Y axis, and I'll sort of pull back. For some reason, my camera's being really jerky. I don't know. Does that come across? Yeah, it must be crappy Wi-Fi in here right now. But anyway, you know, you've got X and Y axes, and you have a scatter of data. And when you think about up till now, for most of you who haven't thought about multivariate or used multivariate analysis before, when you find a line, it's often about the regression line, right? Um, and multivariate analysis, you have to kind of change your perspective on that a bit. You're finding a new axis. So it's, it's not in the case of the turtles, it's not the height of the shell and the length of the shell that are on the axes. It's some new axis that I'm finding that I'm going to plot each turtle on, real, real turtles, but it's to fulfill some criterion that I have for, for locating that axis. So that's what I do this a lot. So you've got the XY plot. Yeah, I think you can kind of see it in the camera. So you've got the XY plot, the usual one, but looking for a new axis, think of it as a line and, and we're shifting it and we're trying to find a line, not the line of best fit in a like in a regression, but it can be similar, but it's the line that really explains that gradient among your observations in those with respect to those two quantitative variables. So let me show you that graphically. And to do this, I, I actually have to get out of um, PowerPoint show so we got and i'll take these i think i can do this without screwing everything up um there so forget about that little black diagonal um and just think of this as a scatter plot. i think this is the actual scatter plot of turtle length versus width i might i think i'm just using the females here but it doesn't matter so we've got you know, this is simple. This is not like high level stats. We've got one quantitative variable on the y axis, that's length, and one quantitative variable on the on the x axis, that's width. And I want to find an axis that if I replotted, I always have trouble saying this word, if I replotted perpendicularly, um, 
every point to that, that that axis, the spread of points along it would be as big as possible. So let, let me just show you what I mean. Uh, if if we're if I'm trying to find and I realize this is kind of super awkward, I should be, you know, better at, at doing this kind of animated thing, but let's let's pretend this is the line. Okay, is that the line that gets me the most spread of observations along the axis? Um, so you have to imagine each of the points, and that's why I've, I've drew these two gigantic points as an illustration. So if we replotted them, this this big one down here, you can see my cross on the thing, right? Okay, it would be replotted perpendicularly, it kind of fall down here on the this new blue axis. This one up here, if I dropped it perpendicularly, would be kind of there. So so it's kind of had that spread along that new axis. Whereas if I put the axis like here, and I, I know it, it's it's tough because it looks kind of like, oh yeah, that's the regression line. No, it's not the regression line. It's remember regression was um we're trying to minimize the sum of square deviations, like vertical deviations from the points to the line. Remember, because we're regressing, we're predicting length from width. This is different. So we're moving this blue line around until, until the point where if we like, see this little one here or the, take this big one up here, it's gonna be here. And then the one down here, again, we're going perpendicularly, not vertically. It's gonna be down here. And that's gonna be the biggest spread along that line. And that's going to be what's known as the first principal component with this two-dimensional multivariate data set. And the cool, you know, you might think, uh, okay, that's really neat, I guess. The cool thing about that is that that works not just in two dimensions, but like if with our three, as we'll see in a minute, our three turtle shell dimensions, or if Flabby and I had 24 different um, water chemistry parameters like chloride, um, phosphorus, nitrogen, all, you know, 25, 30 of them, it finds that axis that has, describes the most amount of variation from one water sample on one end, one water sample on the other. So it's, it's taking multivariate data and saying, where is the major gradient in the multivariate data. Um, and it does that, it's something called eigenanalysis, but you know, as you know, I don't really care about math or anything like that. I, eigenanalysis is what's finding that, and you know, some of you maybe were math minors in your previous life or whatever, you would know this. Eigenanalysis is basically what you're going through to find that axis. And once it's found the axis, you can say, well, what role does each of the original variables play in defining that new axis? So we can tell that by the angle between, see the angle between the blue axis, the new axis and the length axis, it's less than 90 degrees. And the, the smaller that angle is, the bigger the role that length is playing in defining that, that axis. And same thing with width. So the angle between the, this new axis and width, that's describing what's the role of width. It could be that there's a negative relationship between the two quantitative variables or, or no relationship. Their role in defining that axis is part of what that eigenanalysis is doing. So you're ending up with what's called an eigenvalue. And that's how much do the observations vary along that, that new axis. And eigenvector, which is what's the role of each of the original variables in defining that, that new axis. So um, if to take this to three dimensions, that's where we get into the breadth. Okay, so I'm gonna 
What you have to imagine to get the whole bread pan, don't breathe, keep one noon, come back, bread, is instead of it being like a loaf of bread, and I think I'll try to do this without crashing and burning. Okay. So I think you can see me and you should be able to see why is it so laggy? Bummer. Is it frozen still? Yeah. Weird. Um, Emily, can you still hear me? I just. I can hear you, but the video has been super uh, okay, laggy. I'm going to switch to the other camera. Feels good. Bread? Everybody see the bread? Okay. So um pretend so what i want you to do is is like envision three dimensions because i hate those cheesy three-dimensional plotting thing never use a three-dimensional plot in any paper or thesis that you write or worst possible is a three-dimensional pie anyway so on the table here i guess we'll have um X X axis. This is really weird because I can't really see what you're seeing. But the flat table is X and Y. So if if I hold the bread up and Z is up and down. Okay. So we got X, Y, and Z. So if I hold the bread like this, think of that as an like an envelope, and there's points inside it, data points inside it. So what I'm trying to show is like the shape of the scatter of points, right? And this this is, I think, it's a really weird Italian loaf because there's this thing in it, but I think this is an Italian loaf. I've got a baguette in a second. Just to show you what PCA is doing, it's finding that gradient, but and and it's describing with the combination of the the eigenvalue and the eigenvector. What are the roles of, you know, this is, let's say this is length, the x-axis length, the y-axis is, is uh, width, sorry, other way around. Y-axis y is length, x-axis is width, and z-axis is height. And so PCA is finding that major gradient of points. So if you, if you plot them along the axis, you get the most scatter along that axis. So somebody tell me, and I want it to be somebody online because it's a little more obscure maybe for you to see this, but where do you think, after all I've said, where is the first principal component? If this was our scatter of data, where, where is that axis? You know, I'm looking for the axis that gives me the biggest scatter of points along it. Where would that axis be? Can you tell, Emily, or is it too obscure? Uh, would it be, like, right up through the middle of the bread? Like, if you came yes. up? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. So, if I... And, and I should have brought like I guess a long skewer or something. But if it went right through the center of the bread, because imagine if it if the skewer went kind of sideways and I replotted the points, it wouldn't be as much variation along that axis. But the biggest, the best, uh, and most variability along the axis would be if we had a new axis that went right through the center of the bread. Now, this is. And, and you can try this at home. Um, 
if this was the scatter of the data, because now we're going to talk about the role of each, how the role of each uh, original variable, it, you know, how you can see what its role is and whether it's major or minor. What if the, the scatter was like this? So what I've got it doing is with, with length and width of the shell, the X and Y axes, there's this positive relationship, just like you see in the um, in the I'm do stop sharing for a sec. So you just see this. Okay. Just like you saw on the slide. So if it's if it's just this relationship where length and width are positively positively related, but height of the shell. See how that I've got, what I've got is the bread, the loaf of bread, just parallel to the base. So it's not really going up in the Z dimension. So tell me the relative role of those three original variables, length, width, and height. Yeah, Flavia. Right. So if we think about what we're going to see when we get a result of a PCA, is length and width will have the same positive role in defining the axis. Height's not going to have much of a role because it's not really in any way defined. It's at like 90 degrees to the major gradient here defined by that first principal component. So here's another one. Let me, let me think of a challenge. And, and let's forget about length, height, and width. Let's talk about different water chemistry variables like chloride and phosphorus and, and chromium or whatever. And let's imagine we've got three of them and it looks like this. So we've got um, some variability, a small amount of variability in the X and Y dimensions, a large amount of variability in the Z dimension, but it doesn't look like um, there's much relationship between any pair of the three variables. So, and, and the first gradient, just like Emily said, the first gradient is still through the center of the bread. And, you know, that's, where, that's what's going to give us the biggest scatter of points. So tell me about the relative role of the three axes in that. And you can just use X, Y, and Z. So, yeah. Right. It's all about Z. Yeah, so that's what happens. And there'll be those of you who see that, you know, you're gonna do PCA with three quantitative variables. And what that first gradient is really describing is what are the relationships there? You know, these two are negatively related. That can happen too. You know, you're gonna have a this kind of relationship, right? Or these two are related, this one, not at all. Or this one, it's all about this one, not the other two aren't doing anything kind of thing. So all of that's happening. And that's why it's a really useful technique. Imagine if you, you know, you've got your 25 water chemistry variables and with one variable replotting all the chemistry along that axis, you can tell a pretty good story about how water chemistry is varying among the Kawartha lakes or wherever you're working. So that's why it's so it's so popular that you're taking multi you know sometimes really complex multivariate data you've measured lots of variables and you're summarizing you're getting that most important gradient okay so um, everybody gets how we get that first principal whoops principal component axis. Now the next question, and I'll I'll share again. Second. Whoop. I won't do captions. <laughs> Is 
okay, we got the first axis, right? We, you know, Emily told us we got the screw right through. That's going to be the, the biggest gradient in the data. It doesn't matter whether we've got two variables or 200 variables. And I've seen PCAs with 200 variables fed in. So that's the major gradient. What's the second major gradient? And the way the way that you determine that, you want to look at the second most important gradient that's orthogonal to the first. Now, what the hell does orthogonal mean? Anybody remember from math? Omar, you were good at math in high school. Hmm? Something with A. Something with A. Actually, no, that's not I don't know. Okay. Anybody remember the the hint there is I'm going to cut the bread. So this is the, this is the scatter. Remember with my original configuration of the bread, it's just little turtle shells to big turtle shells. That's the major gradient. The the orthogonal, the second most important gradient is the one that's at 90 degrees to that. This is where you wonder whether you're actually going to eat this bread. <laughs> so here's what's happening. If you've got the scatter of the data, it's inside that bread, right? And then we've looked around. <laughs> I'm going to drop it. We've looked around and found that major gradient. Then we look at 90 degrees to that. So where's the major gradient? Where, if I find an axis here, and replot the points along that axis, where's that gonna be this time? And Emily, you don't get to answer. Yeah, like this, This. these are the potential candidates and I'm just gonna spin around, just tell me to stop. Yeah, yeah, so if, and again, we've got our imaginary points that are inside the bread. I guess that's kind of like raisin bread. But um, if you imagine replotting them along that axis, that's going to be give you the most scatter versus not that one. because It's just going to be you know a little bit of scatter. But this is the best you can do. And just like with the first big axis, the major axis, you can figure out what role each original variable plays in defining that one. That's your second most important gradient. And then your third, if we had four dimensions, I don't have a four dimensional loaf of bread, but if we had four, we'd go orthogonal to that and so on. So PCA, you can define as many gradients as you have original variables. Because with the bread, so this is the second one. The third one, which is trivial, is just 90 degrees to that, right? There's no search for the third one with three-dimensional data. So it's just there. That's the third. And that gets us to a, a really common problem with PCA is, okay, I'm getting these gradients. It's fun to figure out what they are if I'm doing water chemistry or turtle morphometrics or whatever, blood spatters. But I... I kind of want to know when should I stop interpreting gradients? Because I'm going to get to a point where it's just kind of like random variation. So we've got this important gradient. We've got the second most important gradient. And then with three-dimensional data, the, the third gradient is just 90 degrees to the second. But where, what makes sense in terms of where do you stop interpreting? So this is just showing finding the second, if you have two dimensional data, the second gradient is just 90 degrees to that first one, the, the red axis there. So there's a, believe it or not, there's people who spent a significant part of their careers figuring out stopping rules for PCA. You know, if I have 20 variables, how many gradients should I interpret before I stop interpreting them? I'm just dealing with random variation the most practical, the technique that I always use and that you'll use in the in the uh, lab three is what's called a scree plot, S-C-R-E-E. -E. So, and 
you're looking at a clue as to what the screed plot is. So in this case, this is the, I think it's just the female painted turtles, but anyway, it's a PCA on those three, three turtle dimensions. And what's labeled comp one, comp two, and comp three are the three describing the three new axes that it's calculated. So the major gradient, the major gradient that's at 90 degrees to that, and then just the one that's at 90 degrees to that second most important gradient. So what you're seeing is that, think about those three, in the case of three-dimensional data, those three axes explain 100% of the variation in those three variables, those three quantitative variables. What you're looking at is how that gets divvied up among these three new principal component axes. So comp one there, piece, the first principal component axis, the most important one, explains 98.6% of the variation in that data set. So that, and that's pretty cool. You might not realize it right now, but that's saying we have this table of turtle shell data and one variable, which is a synthesis of, of the three original shell measurements, explains almost 99% of the variation in all three of those variables. So if I use that in whatever modeling or other stuff I'm doing, that's pretty cool. And if I talk about, you know, what, how do the original variables define those, excuse me, principal components, that's that's even better. So, you know, I've written papers just about PCA of different aspects. Omar and your stuff, you know, you're working a lot with weather data, uh, you know, daily data over nine, 10 years. And so the type of thing uh, we've done research in that is to think of each of those numbers that describe each day, put that all into a PCA and then you end up with maybe one, maybe two variables that describe how the weather varies over time. You had your hand up, Flavia. Yeah. One PC, the first principal component axis. So remember you're replotting and, and the R script that we'll, we'll use after the break does that. So it says, okay, I got the length, what, height, and width of the this turtle shell number 12. I know the role that each axis plays in placing the turtle on that new principal component axis. So I'm gonna calculate that and then I'm gonna stick her on the axis. And so what you're looking at is what was the variation, actually standard deviation along that axis. That's what that 25.06 is there. How does that compare to the second one? How does that compare to the third one? And this is where we get to judging how much we're going to interpret. When you do a PCA, I think, I think you do it with three quantitative variables. The, the only judgment you have to make is, do I have two gradients to interpret or do I have just one? And what you're seeing here with the turtle data is, well, it's similar to this kind of, this kind of scatter. So here's a baguette. In the case of in the case of the Italian loaf, remember when we look for that second gradient, we had a choice to make, right? When I was going around looking for the axis and Flavia said stop, I got to the point where if you plot the points along that axis, you get much more variation and if you plot it along this axis. But with the turtle data, you know, you get you get the major axis, which is still right through the loaf of bread, but then you go orthogonal to that, and I'll try to make this as obvious as possible. You know, it's it's kind of questionable where I stop, right? They're all about the same scatter if i replot the points on that second that's exactly what we're seeing in those three pcs from the looking at the turtle shells notice how the the variation the variance on that 
uh, the screen plot that you see underneath there is huge. It's over 600 for the first principal component X. It's tiny for two and three, and two and three are very similar, just like they would be here. The scatter here, very similar to the scatter at 90 degrees to it. So that's that's how we judge. That's how you'll judge when you look at your um, principal component analysis is you look for this, what I call a flat zone, where, and I always think you've got the situation kind of like the baguette where, yeah, it's finding one that's slightly more variable, but not a heck of a lot relative to 90 degrees to it. So the results for um, the turtle shells, this is showing you it's something called loadings, which is, which is how it's a way of describing the role of those original variables in defining each of the principal component axes. So the first axis, which is, you know, they all have the same sign. So these loadings can be either positive or negative and big or small, big meaning one, depending on the standardization, could be a little bit over one, but in this case, they're standardized. So it's kind of like a correlation coefficient. So what this is saying to us is that first principle component axis, axis, all of the original variables are playing a positive role in defining that. That's, that's a scatter like this, right? A little bit different, like lengths playing more of a role than width and height, but they're all positive. They're all substantially above zero. The cool thing, well, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, Principal component two is what's called a shape axis. And that shape axes are not always, they don't always pertain to like morphometrics, like measuring things like turtle shells. They're just a situation where you get that mixture of positive and negative coefficients. So there's, there's a different, a, a positive relationship between the axis and the length of the turtle shell but a negative relationship between um, the axis and the width and height of the turtle shell. But tempering that is the fact that, remember that axis was kind of like this. So the first, it, it's the combination that you'll use in interpreting your PCA, that is how important was the first gradient, the second gradient, and then what was the role that the original variables played in, in interpreting what that axis means. So this is the results of uh, PCA of the, uh, of the turtle shells. I guess I do have both the, the uh, males and females in here, the 48 turtle shells. And you can see it, it, it's very much like an ordination. In fact, it, it look it's the same data. So it looks kind of like that NMDS ordination we did uh, last week. But in this case, it's done the replotting. You know, it's figured out where each turtle lies on the, the first principal component axis. That's the X axis in this, in this figure. And the second one, and bear in mind, again, that second axis, we determine, well, that's, that's much, not much different than random variation, but it's plotting it here anyway. And this is just showing you um, a little bit about the nature of of the uh, you know how how the original variables help you interpret the nature of those principal component axes. So what you've got here, this is a SPLOM, and I think we did a SPLOM in Lab One, but maybe not this year. Um, so this is a matrix of just scatter plots with a little bit more information. It's, it's actually a pretty busy plot. I wouldn't put this in a paper, a little bit too busy, but you're seeing uh, male and female turtle shells. The, the females are, looks kind of pinkish and the males look kind of bluey grayish. Um, and so the, the, just to get you oriented, this top, well, first of all, the diagonal is just the, like a frequency distribution for that, particular variable, in this case, length for um, males and females. And then this second 
or the scatter plot up here is length on the x-axis. And I'm just going to move our pictures out of the way here. Length on the x-axis and width on the y-axis. So that's what you're seeing here. And obviously, strong positive relationship between length and width, uh, length and height, and width and height. And then up here, sort of at the corresponding spot on the upper half diagonal, you're seeing the correlation coefficient, the overall correlation coefficient between length and width, which is 0.978, and then the one specific to females and males there. So there's lots of information there. This is more the kind of plot I might use kind of when I'm working on the data before deciding what I'm going to present in a, in a talk or a paper. But what I wanted to show you, the and I think the PCA script that we're going to use cranks this out at the end. I want to show you that these uh, bottom two lines are the PC scores. And so two things to point out. So th this is where, for each turtle shell, we've calculated where it falls on that first gradient, where it falls on that second gradient. And you can see the scatter plot of the first gradient versus the second is this plot right here, and they're uncorrelated. That's what it meant to be orthogonal. So the axis is 90 degrees. The second axis is 90 degrees from the first one, orthogonal, and that translates into completely uncorrelated. Notice the correlation there is zero. A slight correlation bigger one with the males, but the overall correlation, since that's what the PCA was working on, is zero. And then look at the quite strong correlation between each of the original variables, length, width, and height, and the first principal component, that first major gradient. And look at the lack of much of a relationship at all in those original variables and the second principal component gradient. So that it's another indication that that first one, yeah, it's an interpretation, small to big turtle shells. But the second one, there's nothing interesting going on with respect to variation in turtle shape relative to the variation in, in turtle shell size. Okay, so you now have got the basics of PCA and, and a couple of things to consider, especially when you're talking about doing your PCA on with your data set. Um, the first is, um, and I mentioned this last time, uh, the whether or not in doing the PCA, you want to consider variation in the original variables or just correlation. Because remember when I when I showed you the bread and we did this, and especially when I did this one, this configuration, um, it was all about the z-axis, right? That's where the main gradient was, as opposed to the x and y axes. But sometimes we want to just look at covariation. So in this case, there's no real a uh, significant level of covariation going on. But in this case, there is, and you know, it varies, but sometimes we want to focus on that and not be worried about differences in just variation as that's what's happening here. That the Z axis, the original variable varies a lot more than the X and Y variables. So when we do that, we do a, we do a PCA not on what's called a covariance matrix, which includes variances and covariances between pairs of variables. We do it on the correlation matrix, which is just what's the correlation? It's the same little r that you're familiar with. And it's using that to determine where the axes are. Basically, it's like using the, the Z scores, the standardized scores for each original variable rather than the variables themselves. So we do that if we're if we want to focus on on correlation and not variation. Um, the other reason we do it, and this will be true for probably most, if not all, everybody's data set, is if your variables are measured in different units. Like imagine if um, 
we measured shell height in microns and shell width in meters. So one's going to have a lot more variation just because of the numerical scale, the measurement scale used. And that's an obvious example, but if you, if you have like a precipitation in millimeters and you also have temperature and degrees and things like you can't you can't combine those and say, oh, well, which one's more variable? Met, you know, when things are measured on those different scales. So in that case as well, you have to use the correlation matrix. And I'll show you when we run the PCA script how to do that. Um, yeah, just like when we did the lab two stuff, I mean, it's much more common. It, PCA, like I said, is very commonly used now. Probably the most common use is to kind of develop an index or a score that's then used in other analyses. Um, and as I was saying, the stuff uh, that I guess the three of us kind of work on in this room, um, very common for us to use it in putting together environmental data. Uh, because PCA is finding linear relationships between things. It's a little bit trickier with uh, like biological community data, things like that, but certainly with with um, weather data or uh, GIS data, like ge geology, land cover, stuff like that, uh, use PCA a lot because again, it, it's not it's not because um, I want to uh, impress everybody with the sophistication of my techniques or whatever. It makes it simpler. It makes it so that, you know, Omar would be able to describe um, weather variation through time using one index. Um, Flavia would be able to talk about water chemistry and how it varied with a couple of the most important gradients in water chemistry when she's me measured 35 different components uh, of that in each of her water samples. So I, the last time I used it, at least in a published paper, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a reprint of this in the module today, just in case you're interested, is climate change. So, and it was totally simple PCA. So uh, Environment Canada um, has gridded out all of Canada. I think they're 50 by 50 kilometer grid squares. And in each of those squares, they've modeled um, how much temperature and how much precipitation has changed over the last 60, 70 years. And so what we did, Trevor Reynoldson and I did for this BC stream study is took each of those variables describing each of the areas and combined them in a PCA to sort of show this area here is dominated, but it's, it's getting warmer and drier. This area here is wetter and not much change in temperature. So it's really handy in terms of creating these synthetic indices of, as I said, describing the environment. 